I have a regular art background, studied art uh, as an undergraduate. Um, but to support myself, I'm from New York City, I worked in various museums. Excuse me, I just had some Diet Coke and I was afraid this would happen. <clears throat> I wasn't drinking. <clears throat> um, I worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the Education Department. Uh, I worked at the American Museum of Natural History in the Education Department. Let's see, now here we go, let's see what happens. Yeah, thank God. Um, and, um, and I worked in other museums. I worked at MoMA for a brief moment, moving artwork around, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it was particularly working at the Museum of Natural History and the American and the uh, the Met at the same time. Sometimes going between the buildings in the same day, uh, installing or teaching. Uh, I began to because they're both these museums across Central Park, and they're both Beaux Arts structures. They both house cultures of, of world cultures. However, how they talk about them and how they display them and how people interact with them is very different from one museum to the other. And I, I noticed that just because I was working in both places and as an artist, uh, as a museum goer, as a, a staff member, um, having all these different roles, I began to sort of see how different one sees the museum from all these different vantage points. And um, I also thought there was something unusual going on with, with these places. Uh, this, you know, Museum of Natural History at that time was a big, dark Beaux-Arts space, and uh, you had lots of children running around. In, uh, in, the, in the Met, the big light-filled spaces, and it's everybody's talking very quietly. I mean, that's just one little thing. But certainly how they spoke about the works were different from one to the other, and I wondered about that. So I started making projects around museums because I figured if a museum's manipulating artists, I wanted to be part of that manipulation. I should also say that um, in my college museum, I, support, to support myself, was a museum guard. And years later, I made this work called Guarded View. It's the guard uniforms of four different museums in uh, New York City. Um, and I always knew I'd make this piece, but I also felt, knowing guards, that, that you know, they were on display, but also invisible. And it was kind of a weird combination. And so that's really what this piece is about. And in fact, um, you know, in many museums in New York, and I imagine elsewhere, uh, the, the uh, museums get a, a great deal of um, uh, either tax uh, deductions or what have you because they have a large minority employment in, in the museum. And, but the, the minorities are, are not in the uh, professional staff usually in New York City. They're in the uh, maintenance, in the guards. So I figured I wanted to do a piece about it. Um, years later, after I'd made the piece, no, before I'd made the piece, uh, I was invited to, and I was a fully working artist, I was invited by the Whitney to give a tour of one of their exhibitions. They're inviting artists to give tours of their exhibitions. And uh, I said, well, I'll do it, but you know, I, uh, I, I'll do it if I can be in costume. And they said, oh great, the artist is gonna be in costume. You know, I don't know if they thought I was gonna be in a bunny suit or whatever, but. <clears throat> so I, uh, they agreed, and so I, had lunch with the docents and some of the education staff, some of the people I'd known for many years because I was working in education in, in other museums. And um, so I said, and at the end of lunch, I said, excuse me, I'm gonna change my clothes now into my costume and I'll meet you downstairs in the galleries. And they said, oh great. So I went and of course I know guards in many different museums because I used to work in, as a guard. Uh, and uh, so I borrowed a guard's uniform and stood by my sign that said, Fred Wilson Speaks. Uh, gives gallery tour, and I stood there, and all the people I had lunch with came, stood in front of me, milling around, waiting for me to show up. Yes, they did. And, you know, 
And then I said, well, let's get this thing going. They were all very embarrassed that you know, I was standing right in front of them. Um, but really, had it not happened, I would have been really surprised because you put on the uniform and you disappear. And um, so this was a performance I did. I walked through the, the installation, marking on the walls. I wrote that problems with the text. And because uh, there were problems with the text of, of this particular exhibition. And, and, uh, and this, the crowd followed me around. And the people, uh, you know, public would look at this and wondering what this guard is doing, talking about these things. And all the guards came off their station and said, you know, I always want to say that about that thing. I always want to say that. It was great fun. Um, so that was called My Life is a Dog. Uh, that's why I love the Whitney. I mean, besides that, uh, you know, but being a trustee, they are really open to a lot of things, and they've always been, and they're a great family of people. And uh, it's, the new museum is really an, the embodiment of this goodwill and uh, really openness. Uh, you know, it's embodied in the architecture. Uh, this is probably one of my earliest museum project. Uh, well, this is not a real museum. This is, a, this is a, a commercial gallery in Manhattan. And I basically painted the walls this, this, this color, as you see, a color like it up in the galleries. Yeah, this is a really old slide, you know, bad color there. But anyway, it was a really nice color at the time. Uh, and um, all I did was darken the walls, spotlight these objects, and people would get off the elevator, because in New York, the galleries were in elevators in, in, the, in the 80s and the 70s. And, um, and they get, they'd say, oh, I'm looking for a contemporary art, and then they get back on the elevator and they go away. Well, this sometimes is the problem that I have, but anyway, it's worth it. Um, and here, as this piece is upstairs, um, I, I think there was some hostage crisis at the time when I was doing this project, but I, this image kept, stayed with me. And um, I created this piece called Colonial Collection, uh, basically uh, masks from West Africa bound and, and, and gagged, but the label says uh, Musée de l'Homme or uh, British Museum. And of course, interesting people, interestingly, people ask me, you know, did the museum really give you that? Actually, Hans Hacke said, where'd you get this, where'd you get this mask? And I said, Hans, I put that mask, I'm, I, I made that, uh, put that flag on that mask. Anyway, people believe what they read in museums. <laughs> and so in the case, as you see upstairs, there's uh, Harper's Weekly from the the, uh, the various uh, various wars between the the Ashanti and the Zulu and, uh, and the British and the, the uh, Zulu and the and the um, British and uh, these insect insect boxes with the names of various African countries with the label um, uh, British Collection uh, 1914 and you know I also I really feel that museums, these, especially with the older collections, and certainly uh, there are still those that are like this, you know, they bring these things to the museum, and this kind of environment, the aesthetic environment of the museum, anesthetizes the historic reality for these objects, and makes you not even think about what, uh, how these things got there. This mask I did absolutely nothing to, except change the label. Um, now, no museum in their right mind would have this label, and certain, some people got upset at me because they said, oh, how could you do this with the mask of someone's private collection? Well, it's my private collection, so thank you very much. Uh, um, and um, it, it, the Smithsonian, in the, uh, one of the African galleries uh, at the Smithsonian, it said, Colonel, so it was a, there was an object with a, uh, a sculpture, and, and it said, Colonel so-and-so acquired this sculpture from the Zonka tribe. I mean, how does a colonel acquire anything when he's traveling through your town? Um, so museums have whole, use, whole host of euphemisms to cover up the messiness of history. Uh, this is another piece from another project that I did called, um, well, see now, these are so old, I'm beginning to forget what they're called. <clears throat> 
um, oh, never mind, Primitivism High and Low. That was the names of two different MoMA exhibitions at one time. Anyway, I had two different rooms, and this room was the, um, was the ethnographic room, and the other room had the guards in it. Um, and this piece of all these vitrines had these uh, skeletons in them, and each one had a label. They said, someone's mother, someone's father, someone's sister, someone's brother. The piece is called Friendly Natives. And I, I was really very struck uh, whenever I give a lecture in a college museum and, and I see different collections that, that uh, some colleges had in anthropology department colleges. And everything, you know, um, they study these, these, uh, these skeleton, skeletal remains uh, of, of native people and then uh, bring them into the museum. And once they're in the museum, they belong to nobody. The humanity is, is gone from them. And uh, so this struck me. The, the, the display, the opportunity of display ch shifts this from being a human, uh, a person, and becomes just an object. Now, I had been um, working on these projects in, in galleries and with making, making my own objects for quite a while. And at some, a certain point, um, you could see almost museum curators, a light bulb going off over their heads. It's like, wait a minute. Fred Wilson makes these fake museum spaces. And we are a real museum. So maybe we could bring him here and we wouldn't have to pay for shipping and he could make a show. <laughs> well, and it's true. Two different museums start, kind of thought of to bring me to their museum uh, to do a project. The first one was uh, the Contemporary Museum in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, they were a museum without walls, and they did projects with artists all over, the, all over Maryland. And they thought if I came, I could pick a museum and do a project in one of the museums in Baltimore. And so I went with them, with the director, to different museums in Baltimore and just to meet them and talk with them. And basically, I was checking them out to see if I wanted to work with them. They had no idea. Uh, and uh, I ended up um, deciding, going to the um, Maryland Historical Society, which, which is this, uh, looks like historical site in many parts of the United States. Um, and I went in there when I, I felt really uncomfortable in the space. So I thought, well, this is, if, why do I feel uncomfortable? This is you know, American history. I've seen works like objects like this before. Why would I feel uncomfortable? This is where I need to make the work. And surprisingly, the director of the museum said, yes, we'll let this, this artist make a project in our, in our historical society. Uh, and I'm very grateful for him for, for, him for doing that. I think he didn't have a major exhibition to, coming up, and he had a big museums conference, and he didn't know what to do, so I just fell in his lap, essentially. But it was a real risk. I don't think he even knew what a risk it was going to, what it could have happened. Um, so basically, oh, I should say, this is Historical Society, and this is, um, uh, this was built as a contemporary museum. This is what happens if you, you know, they hadn't really thought about display in a very long time but it was a contemporary museum in 1850. Uh, um, so basically all I did was look at every object in the museum, things that were on display and things that were in storage. And with old museums like this, um, things that were on display tell you a lot about the museum, but things in storage tell you even more. And really this project was about uh, the museum. And so I had to speak to everyone. I spoke to everyone, including the director of the board and the woman who cleaned the silver and the maintenance and the, and the uh, kitchen staff, uh, the registrars and conservators, everyone, about what this place was about. And I looked at every object in the museum. Was, uh, I was able to do that and because and, uh, I had a year to work on this project. And it's from all that and uh, talking to everyone that this project emerged, because I'm not from Maryland. I had the entire third floor to do my project, and I'd just be pulling things out to sort of arrange this display. And I really feel that uh, my, my museum projects are, you know, the, their installations, they just look like museum, museum display. It's sort of the still life of, of a museum. It's not, real, it's not a real image, it's actually my creation to look like a museum. It's about other things. Anyway, one of the first things I found was this globe. 
um, it was in it was in their uh, silver storage, and it, it was so unusual to me. It looked like something. It looked like a contemporary object, but uh, it wasn't. And uh, the word "truth" was was across it in brass letters. So I thought this was a perfect object to have as you first enter my my exhibition. Uh, Who's truth when you look at history? Uh, so, where's the truth in museums? So I, uh, this is how I wanted to put it, and um, I surrounded it with these empty plastic mounts, uh, and a, there was a label that described the, the globe, um, which it was made in, um, I forget the exact year, in the 19th century is made, but it was made as a, glo as a, as a trophy for truth in advertising, and uh, you know, it came to the museum, and, and then of course people forgot about truth in advertising, I guess, but anyway, it's, it's <clears throat> And the label, there was a label for the mounts too, which said, plastic mounts, May 1970s, maker unknown, because I wanted people to go through my exhibition and realize that everything, I manipulate everything, and that everything has his history, even if it's recent history, and so it's all a part of this larger story. Well, actually, there was no name for my exhibition as you first walked in. That was the first thing you saw, and there was nothing there. Uh, and actually, as I was working this project, it was the director was getting, well, actually, it wasn't the director that was getting nervous. It was the PR department because they wanted to, to sort of promote this thing. And I, you know, I'm just looking at things and sitting in the president's office, which was my studio, and just trying to figure out what this project was. Well, anyway, the director was, uh, was trying to help, and he said, well, why don't we call the show Museum Held Hostage? And I'm like, oh, no, we're going to get along here. It's not going to be that. He was a little nervous. He was a little nervous about what was going to happen. I decided to call it... Uh, mining the museum because basically I was digging through things and perhaps I was going to blow up some ideas about uh, history. Uh, and, but more than anything else, I wanted to make the museum mine. And so it was from my particular vantage point that I did this project. And surrounded this, this globe were these busts. Um, I hope, is this a pointer? Let me see. Where is that? No, it's not a pointer. Unless I'm pointing the wrong way. Anyway, anyway, I have these three busts, and um, the one on the far left is Henry Clay. The one on the far right uh, was uh, Andrew Jackson, not a favorite of mine. Um, now, this is the Maryland Historical Society. Everything in, in, this, in this museum supposedly has something to do with Maryland. In the center is Napoleon. Now what he was doing in Maryland, I don't know. They don't know, it was just there. But I put him in there anyway. On the other side were three pedestals without busts. Uh, but so I, since there weren't any busts, I put labels. Uh, let's see, Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, Benjamin Banneker. Three African Americans, very important to the nation, all of them from the Maryland, from Maryland, and nothing about them in the Maryland Historical Society. So my project was a, was about not just what the museum collected, but what it didn't collect, and you know what it didn't collect said a lot more than what it what it did collect. And the, and for me, rather, I mean, I could have collected incredible amounts of information about African American history. Uh, because Maryland is full of it. And, uh, but I really was interested in what the museum was collecting and why they collected it and what they weren't, you know, what was their view of the world. And the only way to know that is to look at the collecting patterns of the museum over the years. Because the, certainly the current uh, curators, this was not their view of history. It was a collective history that developed over the years that was given to them and obviously they weren't even aware of, of this. So, you know, you walked around, you, a lot of reading between the lines in this project. Uh, next were these uh, cigar store Indians. Now, every museum has them. They're a little embarrassed about them. They don't know what to really do with them. But they are beautiful sculptures as, as carvings. Uh, and so I pulled them from all over the museum and put them all together and have them facing the wall. And the label says, Portraits of Cigar Store Owners. Um, and the one on the far 
on the one, one on the far left was actually sculpted by a German immigrant uh, of, her, of his daughter. And here we have, you know, this Fraulein in brown face. But anyway, um, what they're facing, I asked the curator if, uh, you know, I wanted to meet the native community in Maryland because the native communities are in all, of, all, these, all these cities around the country. And she said, well, uh, there are no Indians in Maryland. I said, oh, really? So I uh, found the native community, borrowed photographs, family photographs, and historic photographs, and that's what these figures facing away from you are facing, so you could see these, these photographs. I don't know if I have another image of it, but let me see. Oh, no, I don't think I do. Uh, what This uh, figure is standing in front of a map of the Chesapeake Bay, uh, which is right there near the museum. And um, it's a, it was from the previous exhibition, which was a duck hunting, uh, a duck decoy uh, show. And uh, the curator was never even happy with the show, but it was a trustee who put her t up to it, so she had to do it. Anyway, a lot of ducks. But anyway, so they had this map of the duck hunting clubs on the map. And I left it as, as even putting something from recent history. I just add the native tribes onto that map. And I, they had, you know, Benjamin Latrobe, a, a famous architect and, uh, you know, um, collector of things, uh, had, gave to the museum this huge collection of arrowheads. And so I put them all out in the case, and the label said, uh, a collection of numbers. And I moved paintings from other parts of the museum to this space. And... Um, uh, that were hanging elsewhere, and because something un, uh, disturbed me about them. However, there's one uh, there's one label that um, I'm excuse me, not one label, one painting that was not on view. I actually asked them, you know, if they had a rip painting, and uh, I said, you know, every museum has a rip painting, certainly old ones, and so I had my choice in this place. But they don't like to let you know that they have rip paintings that have not been conserved yet. So anyway, I borrowed this this rip painting. You see it, it's kind of hard to see here, and I, unfortunately, I don't have a good picture of it, but on the far right um, is a picture of this, this uh, 19th century white gentleman, and the, 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 the rip was across his face. And so what I ended up doing was making a videotape of uh, the maintenance man, who was African American, and he, he spoke through the image. So you had half, one, half the painting face and half the, the video face, speaking to you through the, through the image. And he would say things like, no one knows I'm inside of you, <laughs> except mama. <laughs> things like that. I have great stories about that particular piece, and uh, you know, I, I, if I, I'll, I'll tell you this one. All the curators came out, because what happened with this project, it, ch it changed a lot of things, and really was quite fascinating within the museum what happened because it made people have to talk to people they normally wouldn't talk to, uh, made the, it destabilized the museum a bit because they didn't know what the public was gonna think, and uh, so they all had to kind of uh, try to deal with this project that was put upon them. Although I tried to speak to everybody, they all knew who I was, so, they didn't, so that people didn't, didn't think I was gonna make fun of them. That's usually what happens with museums, they think I'm gonna, you know, that's, it's gonna make them look bad. But it's not about them, it's about you know, the combination of history combination of history throughout that museum. Anyway, the, the, uh, the docents at the museum, which I felt really, you know, feel, felt for because they were the ones who had talked with the public, not the curators, about this project. But apparently, the, the, the docents stood in front of this, this work here with, the, with the, the, the video coming through the face, and they said, the three, there were four or five of them, and, and the curator was behind the wall hearing this, saying, well, they were just upset about, well, why do we have to talk about this project? I mean, this is about, you know, passing for white. That's how they, they view this project. Why would we have to talk about this? These young kids are not going to be able to understand it. It's not going to be, you know, it's not really, it's not, not, it doesn't make any sense to talk about it now. That's an old thing. And one of the docents said, well, I'm African American. And, you know, they didn't know. And I didn't know. He was, you know, a very light complexion man. He, he lived in the, in the black community. But when he got to the museum, he became a part of the museum and didn't have a reason to talk about it. And actually, everybody who came to the museum left who they were outside the museum to take on the mantle of this particular, um, 
you know, storyline within the museum. In fact, this museum, well, I'll continue before I say this. So all the other museums, uh, excuse me, all the other paintings, I pulled from other parts of the, the, uh, the museum. And this one, uh, there are seven children in the painting. This is a dark slide, I think, yeah. But there's one child at the lower right, that white is his collar, and one child in the upper left in the doorway, you see his shoulder, his uh, arm, the shoulder. So there are seven children in the painting. Um, and, these, and all these paintings had a black child in the periphery. Um, the label, where it was in the other part of the museum, listed all the children in the center, uh, but not these children in the, in, the, in the periphery. So I did some research and found out their names because this, this, this historical site had a big library and archive. So it was easy to find out the names, so they could have done that had they thought of it. And um, so I decided not to put the names on the label. I decided to leave it as it is and have, as you step in front of it, a light to illuminate all the children, including the two black children. And then I did audio tapes with black children from Baltimore because they have a very specific accent. Um, and they would say things like, where is my mother? Who calms me when I'm afraid? Who washes my back? Things like that. And so each painting, as you stepped in front of it, would, would say something. This one, you know, uh, this painting was right by the front door, and, the, and um, the director said, you know, I never noticed that black child in that painting. Now, I think that's a stretch. I just, I can't figure that one out. I just cannot, he came in there every single day. I don't, I don't get it, I don't get it. But you know, you were not meant to see these children. The museum, Focus your attention on the elite of Maryland. You're supposed to think about the elite of Maryland and not average Marylanders, not immigrants, certainly not the black population. And museums are great, great silencers of dissent. They can focus your attention and you don't even know it. And you don't ask the questions because you're not even aware of how the environment is, is affecting you. And the labels say one thing, but the environment is telling you a lot more. So anyway, he didn't, hadn't seen it before. But anyway, that was him. Uh, but we moved the painting, and when we got up close, we realized the black child had a metal collar around his neck. This is a 16th century, I mean, a 17th century painting. And, you know, the, the black child has the bird, the white child has the bow and, bow and arrow. He's sort of like the golden retriever for that child. The voices on this painting said, am I your friend? Am I your brother? Am I your pet? And, you know, in the horrors of slavery, he could have been all three. Uh, this painting, uh, you know, in, in uh, 1850, people were not naming paintings, giving them titles. So uh, there's a, the, the title on the wall when I first saw this painting was Country Life. It's by a painter named uh, Ernest Fisher. But since Country Life probably was not, you know, created by the, the painter, uh, someone else, you know, made the, either the collector or the museum decided to just this was what it looked like, so they called it Country Life. Someone else made the title. So I figured, well, um, you know, I can name it too. So I left the title on one side of the painting, and I added my own title on the other side of the painting, and I called it Frederick Serving Fruit. <laughs> you know. my, it just so happens my name is Frederick. Um, but also it could have been Frederick Douglass. He was from Maryland. Anyway. Now, this museum uh, had most incredible repoussé silver in their collection. Um, and you know, museums have really, you know, they'll, you'll have a museum for all the, the beauty of the museum and then you'll have of, the, of our culture. And you have a museum for the horrors of our culture. And this is true everywhere around the world. But rarely do you have all that in the same museum. One affects the other and one is the reason for the other. And here, uh, under, and of course, since this museum was you know basically it was about connoisseurship. Things were described just basically for how they looked. I I left the kind of labels that uh, that they would have. I I also did. And this was called Metalwork, 1793 to 1880. And uh, of course, in the ledger books, I also found slave shackles, and uh, certainly whose labor uh, you know who had to serve the silver and whose. Uh, 
labor support of wealth that could produce the silver, and, uh, and who could have made those silver objects in apprenticeship situations at the end of slavery. So I felt once having these things in the same display case really brought out uh, another part of that history that nobody particularly wanted to talk about. It was just by putting these two things together. And here under the heading of modes of transport is the, in the center here you have the sedan chair of the last royal governor of Maryland uh, and a painting of who, of who was carrying around that sedan chair. And then um, in the background you see the display case, uh, there's a, a ship, a model ship called the Pride of Baltimore. Uh, and the ship, they have a, they have a full version of it in, in Baltimore Harbor. And um, beneath it are these, uh, are the, basically the, the uh, uh, galleys and and uh, listings of uh, you know livestock and things that they were bringing on the ships, including slaves, and then these two baby carriages under the heading of modes of transport. However, in I found this Ku Klux Klan hood in textile storage. Of course, um, I could almost you know I really got along very well with the, with the curator. We, we, I get, the only way I get to do what I do is because I get along with everybody really well. It's not about them. It's, you know, these things are there. They know they're there, but they, you know, uh, I'm not bringing something in from the outside. It's there. Uh, you know, but I can almost hear her say, twisting her pearls, saying, oh, he found the clan hood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. And, but, you know, they were really great. They said, you want the clan hood? You can have the clan hood. Um, and I put it in this baby carriage. And on the wall was a, was a photograph of black nannies with, with white babies. And certainly just the whole notion, for me, the notion of just these, these, these ideas, these racist ideas come at an early age and they're placed on the child. It's like, and of course the material was the same material as what was in the, the, uh, the baby's uh, uh, linens there. Interesting thing happened with this show. The show opened for um, the, Muse the American Museums of uh, American Association of Museums, a national organization. It opened, and I, the director, I think, smoked more cigarettes that morning than I'd seen him smoke the entire year I worked on this project. He was a little nervous, but it went very well. People really liked the show. It was the big, you know, it was a big deal, and. Um, after the show was not it was supposed to be up for only for a few months, but the show st stayed up for a year, and then uh, actually for a couple of years, uh, and uh, basically it came out in the New York Times, and 50,000 people saw this show. And so they thought that the staff asked if they could bring, you know, it was coming down, but they asked if some a smaller portion of the show could would, could could uh, be reinstalled be up for a longer period of time. And, and the director said, sure. And so they particularly asked for this particular image, this, this baby character, to be in the show, which I thought was amazing for a historical society to deal with this. Um, but I would get calls from the education department from time to time. And um, one time they called, you know, just to talk about the exhibition and what to do about certain situations. And um, one time, a curator called, I mean, the educator called me and said, you know, we have a school group coming in, and some of their parents are in the Klan. What should we do? <laughs> so, you know, we had a great conversation about it. I don't remember what I said. I know, I, what I do know is I said, don't give out my telephone number, otherwise. <laughs> but, um, so I was really, really, uh, the museum kept this project up for many years. Uh, and and dealt with whatever issues came up around it. And but you know, I think the project, the great thing about museums, and the great thing about this particular museum, uh, was that you know it's a safe space for unsafe ideas. That's what I like to believe. If you do it right. And here uh, in their cabinet making storage, this is called mm, cabinet making. Um, there I found these chairs and I put them in an arrangement that I felt was kind of like different members of society. And then in the basement, there was this big wooden thing lying there. I said, what's that? And the curator said, oh, that's the public whipping post. <sighs> we got that, and, you know, they, they, they used that till 1958 and then we got it. I don't know what to do with that thing. 
And I said, well, I know what to do with that thing. Anyway, so it, it, for me, it was this you know, gruesome thing. It's sort of a little crucifixion scene for me. Um, and I, uh, in the children's area, I found this doll's house. And, um, you know, at this point, you know, the staff sort of was getting, figuring out as I was pulling things out what I, what, where this project was going. And one of the, the docent who, who tended to the doll's house in the children's gallery said, oh, not the doll's house is nothing sacred. <laughs> she said that. She really did. Give me that doll's house. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, you looked in the doll's house, and I brought the docents to look at it as a way to kind of get them to sort of think about it where, when it was where it was in the children's area. You look at the doll's house, and um, there, the, uh, the, the female doll was in the kitchen. The white female doll was in the kitchen. The black female doll was, was in the bedroom. No, I think it was reversed. It was reversed. The white female doll was in the bedroom. The, the black female doll was in the kitchen. Uh, the black male doll was standing by the door. And the white, uh, the white male doll was sitting in the parlor. So I figured, here are all these very stereotypical arrangements just there for children to absorb uncritically. And I'd asked the, the docents, where were you in this house? And, they all, and a lot of them just kind of balked at it because one said, well, I was, my family came here in you know, the 19th, 20th century and we're not around for that. And they had their, their t discussions about their, you know, what they thought I was trying to get at and they talk about this. But really, I wanted, what would happen was they became less about this collective view of being an elitist, an, an elite in the museum and more of who they are outside the museum and which was kind of uh, the point of, of that little exercise with them to sort of um, become who they are. Anyway, um, I took the doll's house and, you know, did a little something to it. Uh, you looked in the doll's house and there was overturned furniture and there were bodies lying around. And then I found this other black doll and put it into, the, you know, a larger black doll, put it into the space into this little the parlor, if I can get it to, there we go. And um, because in this archive, they had a little book by a diary by a, a lady who remembered Nat Turner's rebellion. And uh, she, you know, she talked about it in great detail. And so this whole, this became a diorama to her experience uh, with that. Um, and one kid said to me when looking at this particular little room, he said, oh, that's super slave. It wasn't exactly what I had in mind, but, you know, it's art. You can sort of, you know, take it where you want to take it, but it wasn't, wasn't horrific. The last galleries of this project uh, were objects that I found in various parts of the museum, uh, you know, like a basket, a ceramic pot, a uh, wooden, I forget, a wooden object. Uh, and uh, they're beautiful, and I'd been looking at them for quite a while, and I decided, and there was some little, little jewelry in their storage rooms, and I looked at them for a long time, and I asked them about them, and they said they didn't really know much about them. So I did a little research, and uh, these were um, African-made, or Africans who, who had just come to the United States, uh, and they were really beautiful, simple objects. And, um, and so I made a display uh, just of those objects because after all this kind of a, uh, the history of abuse uh, and violence, um, I wanted this cultural production that still, after all that, that still was retained in these objects. And uh, of course they had no idea about what these things were. They were just sort of used as uh, in kind of a diorama settings of the, you know, the, the kitchen or what have you. Uh, and so it turns out many of them were the earliest things from Africa in the United States because they came with uh, missionaries and, and various other expeditions. Um, so this, the last space is this space that you see. It is, um, uh, there's a book on the table that was quite important uh, to their collection. It was the only object of African American history that, that they that was of importance that they had. And it's a book by Benjamin Banneker, who was a free black man in the 1700s who surveyed Washington, D.C. for Thomas Jefferson after Lafont died. Uh, he was a mathematician, 
and he was an amateur astronomer, and he made this book of the, uh, the charts of the eclipse of the sun and the moon, and he gave it to Thomas Jefferson. And uh, that was a great thing, great inspirational thing to, to have as the last room uh, in the wall are these images of the eclipse of the sun and moon that, are, that, that uh, cycled through. And what this woman is reading are copies of, the, of what he wrote in the book, which were his strange dreams, and also who tried to kill him, and you know, because being free in the 1700s wasn't all that free. And then this computer, I mean, that's like a museum piece now also, that old computer, but anyway, um, has, I, I researched the star dates and uh, put that on the computer. Um, and the last image on the wall was the first line of the, of the letter to Thomas Jefferson, which said, Dear Sir, I freely and cheerfully acknowledge I'm a member of the African race. And I thought, wow, for a 17th century man to say to the President of the United States, uh, that's an excellent way for me to end this project. And it was a very, this project changed my life, changed my career, because 3,000 museum professionals saw it in three days, and the idea, notions of this went all across the country, and so every historical society in America was inviting me to their dungeons. <laughs> I decided I couldn't handle that, and uh, I just was, wanted to get away from, from those kind of environments. Uh, and uh, worked at various other museums with various other kind of collections. And, um, and I've been doing that for since 1992, around the world. Uh, I, I don't know where we are here. I'm, I, I talk too slow, tell too many stories. But anyway, I'll show uh, what I can show. Um, uh, this is a more recent project. Um, again, it's, you know, I should say that it seems that I'm highly influenced or, or is usually about African Americans, but it only is when, it, when that subject is what speaks to me. Uh, when I was in Poland, there weren't any Africans anywhere uh, to speak of, and, and not, certainly not in their museums or Sweden or wherever, and the projects vary, and every, all the time that I do it, they say, oh, I don't have any slave shackles, come on in. And then, of course, I find out what, you know, what the largest thing they were not talking about, screaming at me, and then like, oh, it's about us. So. It very, becomes very personal, and, but we all get along really well because it is an exhibition after all. It's gonna come up and come down, but the lingering conversation between staff and between the public and the institution is what really is the important thing for me. And I should say that one other thing I have to say about this particular project, uh, Mind the Museum, was that one museum, professor, one museum director said to me at the, at the opening, he had never had an emotional experience in a museum, which I thought was pretty sad. Another one um, said to me, he walked through the historical society and just so it was a regular old historical society, and then he, he went up to my exhibition and walked through my exhibition, which he thought was highly subjective, and when he walked back down through the, through the museum, he realized how subjective the museum really was. And for me, this is all about point of view and being able to see what you're actually within and what it's, how it's speaking to you, what it's doing to you. Uh, so my project is just a way to elicit seeing the museum, seeing the reality of, of the rest of the museum. Anyway, that that's, was that project, and I'll quickly try to talk about, oh God, this is terrible. Um, I'm just, you know, keeping you hostage here. But anyway, this, uh, this is a more recent project, and so things have shifted uh, in the way I'm working. You know, of course, I'm an artist, and things are going to shift. But this is uh, in, in Savannah, but again, this is the, uh, another one that, came to this subject matter. Um, obviously, Savannah is, is a highly historicized environment. Um, and this is the, mu the museum, the Savannah College of Art Museum, which is new, which I thought they did a great job using an old building, old railroad station, and, um, and infusing it with a contemporary museum. So you see both, which makes it work pretty well in Savannah. It had a content. They want, brought me down to, because this, this African-American uh, collector had African-American art collection, and I'm not particularly interested in making a regular art exhibition, but I figured it's un unusual for me to actually work with a collector. So I went to his house and, and saw the collection that the museum had of his. He had a special room, and he had Jacob Lawrence and, and various other things. Uh, but as I began to talk to him about his artwork, he was also really excited about something else. He had. He had a collection of letters and uh, an archive, huge archive of writing. Um, everything to do with African Americans, 
he had letters by, you know, what can I say? He had, you know, you name it, anybody of note since the 1500s, if they wrote something down, he had it and signed by them. Uh, this is not by an African American. This is by Napoleon to Toussaint L'Ouverture. Basically, he wrote, you know, Napoleon wrote to Toussaint L'Ouverture to say, "Come on, come on to, come on to France. We're, you know, we like you. Come in." Anyway, uh, this is a letter uh, by Malcolm X on the Hajj. Uh, Frederick Douglass, one of his letters. And so I got very excited because I don't like just to work with art. I, you know, it's, it's about the combination of things. And I thought the letters and the artwork, this was where I was gonna do this project, never worked with material like this. So I made an exhibition of the art and, and all these, um, this, uh, uh, this written material. And basically it became a, a kind of a, a pairing and discussion between what was written and, and the images. And because this is all African American, this history of of the struggle, depending, never mind if it's Alice Waters or, um, Alice Waters, <sighs> I just changed her entirely, didn't I? <laughs> Alice Walker, thank you. <laughs> and you know, uh, Sojourner Truth, you know, just kind of across history, kind of the things and notions are, are they follow this path. And so in the, in the space, uh, were, were these these tables of, of, of these subject matter, uh, particular subject matters, one about revolt, one about, um, you know, um, a po a kind of a poetic one, and various uh, travel, and uh, with artwork. Now, I should say that when I, when I first went to this museum, the curator said to me, I said, this is an incredible old building. She said, oh yeah, well, you know, this whole building is, are, is made of slave-made bricks. I'm like, Oh, okay, all right. And so the project, uh, for me, that was a really important moment and I knew where this project was gonna go. Uh, and um, because this, right near that they had a um, uh, plantation originally where all the bricks were made for the entire town uh, and this one, one, uh, plant, on this one plantation and even this, the enslaved people who made the bricks lived in these brick houses that they created on the plantation. And, um, and then, so all around the city, these, this particular gray brick you find. And it's actually more expensive than normal brick now if you find them, not because it's historic, but because you know, it reminds, them, reminds the folks of old Savannah. And they are a pretty brick, so they put them in their gardens and little walls and things. But you know, if you go on one of the tours, there is a brick in a wall that you see a thumbprint so it's, it's quite, you know, Savannah is a spooky place anyway, but this is, uh, you know, as much as I love Savannah, but this was just this, what I needed to sort of really make this project. Uh, this, is the where, this is the building before, and then they, they created this uh, space in it. And uh, so basically there is brick and objects. This is about revolt. Uh, here's sort of a, a listing of all the kind of bricks used in, in Savannah. Uh, including Home Depot brick, and the last one is the slave-made brick. And, you know, I use brick throughout, sort of enclosing, making barriers, enclosures, uh, and uh, walls and such, because in the background is, is, the, is the building peeking through in this white room gallery, and these sculptures are by, um, there's an exhibition of, of art, and basically I kept them, kept the artwork, this is by Elizabeth Catlett, and uh, surrounded them some things with brick. These are not the slave-made bricks. I couldn't afford that many of these because they were, these are just, you know, bricks from ruins, uh, more contemporary ruins. Uh, this, that particular piece is by uh, Aaron Douglas. Go Down Moses is the name of that. And uh, this is another work um, by Rich, uh, Richmond Barthay. Uh, and surrounding it, uh, and in behind there's not only this, this sculpture by him, but uh, uh, letters from James Baldwin to various people. And this whole, this particular image, kind of someone said it was uh, a sort of an existential, existential uh, piece here uh, between the letters and, uh, and this enclosure. And so it continued around the room like that. Uh, 
this table, I included this huge table in the, in the space because uh, at, at uh, this collector's home, uh, Dr. Walters, he, uh, Dr. Walter Evans, he, he, he got so excited he'd bring these books out. He had these boxes made, really beautifully leather-bound boxes, and he'd pile them on the desks for me to look at, and it was like in the canyons of these boxes, opening them up and with a great flourish, and I'd see this incredible letter or, or book that he had. And so I was sitting within it. So I decided to reproduce this whole scenario, had these boxes made. But in these boxes, in my boxes, uh, were not letters. Uh, they were slave-made bricks. There'd be one in each box. So literally, you hold a box, and they have the weight of history in them. But nobody, nobody got to lift them as just and, and so, and this is how they would be labeled. Uh, in his collection, and these are mine. You know, I, I really like this. I'm going to just sort of flip through, show you some of these, but I'm not going to talk much about them because this is a painting. Because I could go on and on, but this is a painting by an artist, uh, Frederick Duncanson, African American artist, and uh, put it in this sort of tableau setting, um, creating a home setting for this for this particular painting, uh, and. Uh, I thought that trying to create, recreate an African-American home, uh, not that these would be in an African-American home, but, but the environment, uh, trying to put, place it in a place and a time that would be uh, not necessarily a home, but something revolving around uh, a tableau about these subjects. These are all from his collection, too. And the, the artist himself, you know, this is just Fisher, boy f fishing, but in fact, the artist was a very light complexion man, and so it, I always thought maybe it could, this could have been a portrait of himself. He didn't say so, but it could have been himself in that painting. And so I created the tableau in that, in that regard. And beneath it, I placed this uh, 1920s uh, uh, little magazine made in Har you know, Harlem magazine for uh, young artists called Fire. And in front, uh, I placed these bricks down in this kind of pattern, and, and these are these are slave-made bricks, and they sort of meander and uh, snake around. Um, and I did this. I started this big project to find out the names of every every enslaved person on that plantation who made bricks. And I was going to inscribe them on these on these bricks here, and then place them in the wall as the building was still being built. But it was extremely difficult. I was not able to do it in the, in the time frame. I also often think that would be a great project at some point to try to resurrect the names of these, these individuals. The project was called Life's Link, and, and that title came to me from this little tiny autograph book, which is you know just a little tiny autograph book that he had in his collection that was uh, Frederick, Tum Frederick Duncanson, the painter's. A book, and he had people describe, that he met would, would write their names in the book. But then I found this little picture in the book, really small, the image is really small, and it, it seemed like something from, the, you know, like the, a surrealist kind of image rather than a 19th century artist. And beneath it, it said Life's Link, and I just thought, well, this is the perfect title for this project because of the linking of all these, you know, the, uh, the art and the, the, the writing, these African uh, individuals and their. Uh, across history, linking them together. So that's the name of that. And you know, I have so much, I have, do have other things, but I think maybe I should. Should I end it here? Oh, yeah, of course, yes. I'm not going anywhere. We have two mics. Okay. Uh, I have a question about the show you did in Maryland and the portrait you did um, with the ripped portrait and the, the speaker behind it. I was just wondering what the process was for creating the dialogue with, with that person and with the kids. Like, 
was it your narrative? Was it something you asked them to contribute to? I was just curious. What was that? What was the last sentence you said? What, was it the, was it your narrative, oh. or was it something you asked them to contribute to? I was just curious about that with the children and right. And, and the well, maintenance we, you person. know, be, when I'm in, with museums, I try to work with whoever at, at the museum will work with me. And in that particular museum, the educators were willing to work with me, so they brought the children in, and we had I had discussions with them about about the children in the painting and extrapolated these lines from, from them. And then, of course, they uh, said those lines. Hi. Um, in your work in Europe, uh, did you have an opportunity to do something with uh, lost Jewish populations or other populations? I like have a, not. You know, that is that not something I've wonderful. done. The only time I work with, you know, the history of the Jewish people was with the JDC. Uh, they have a huge photo archive, and um, uh, I did a project with some of, with the photographs that they had. And as uh, the Jewish uh, Jewish Museum of New York owns this now, uh, but it was using many of their photographs in a particular way. I you know I, I, I will talk a lot if I have to talk about that one. But yeah, that's the only time. And so uh, yeah, in Poland it was more it was about uh, about the Poles and their and their. Um, their history of being like in a location surrounded by, you know, just enemies, <laughs> you know, and uh, the oppression that, anyway, that's a whole other story. Yeah, no, I haven't. Well, the question is, if you could create only one more piece uh, that will be your masterpiece. Oh, God. She did. What would it be oh, the and earth's where? Oh, shaking here. What's, what's that? What would it be? What would it be and where? You know, I you know it's it's a, that's a really rough question for artists. You know who you know you you love the the most recent thing you've done, and you know, and for for me these things I I never tell a place I want to do a project there. They always come to me because it's so invasive what I do, and you know, they have to really want this, uh, uh, even though we get along really well. Um, so I I don't dream up places because you know who knows if I'll ever. And sometimes it's, it's wrong. I, I did a project with the British Museum and thought, oh, this is going to be. But it was really a great project, but there was, they only let me do a little bit. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's nothing British in the British Museum, and that's, just, that's what, you know, they don't want anybody to reveal that. <laughs> um, uh, um, but at any rate, uh, so yeah, I have my wish list, I suppose. I had wanted to do something in the zoo, but now I'm not really sure I want to do that anymore. But um, yeah, I don't. I, I, I'll think about it and tell you afterwards. Um, I always had the perception that you were kind of influenced by people like Michael Asher and other oh. artists associated with this idea of institutional critique. But after hearing you talk about your work, it seems less like a critique and more like a commentary or a dialogue. Um, do you think that might be a more accurate? Well, it's, you know, I don't know if that's accurate, but certainly I didn't really, wasn't really highly familiar with Michael Ash's work when I first started doing this. I just had this uh, real fire in the belly, a mad, when I go through exhibitions and just see, you know, these things that they weren't saying, that were, that were screaming. And so it really came from that rather than, you know, uh, uh, you know, Michael Asher and other historical figures with critique. Although, I think Michael's great, in fact. We know him now, you know, but, um, but uh, and glad that what I, you know, I'm an artist, I have an art background, but gl and glad that this could be put in within a context, an art context, and not just seen as marginal weirdness. But, um, but, um, no, I, but I think it's a combination, really. It's very, they're very personal no matter what it is. And it, it, you know, uh, the last most recent thing is, was, is not institutional critique, that one that I, particularly the more recent things, but the early ones definitely uh, are a critique of, of uh, their denial and their you know, kind of blinders uh, about whatever they're particularly you know, not thinking about. And again, I don't blame the, the contemporary curators um, but actually, now I can because it's been 20 years of making this kind of work, and if they don't realize they have to look at their collections differently, well, shame on them. But, uh, uh, you know. Hi. 
Hi, I just, I, sorry, stand up. I have a question for you. I noticed in several of the exhibits you talked about, um, there was a refrain in the sense that you all got along <laughs> in, in every oh, yeah. instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering, is that part of your pedagogical strategy, right? Because there has it's to be It's part an of element. my personality. I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> I'm making a lot of jokes. No, um, it really is part of, and it's part of who I, it's really so deeply embedded in who I am. Okay. I'm sort of just using, using who I am to, to make this happen. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not sort of strategizing at all uh, in that regard. However, when I'm in an institution, I realize who are those who are either like-minded or, or open or, under, you know, kind of get it as I go along, and those who really have a block. Mm -hmm. And I go to where, where, where there's heat, you know, and uh, work with the people who are, uh, who sort of, you know, understand what I'm doing. And so th that's why I say they really have to want me there. And I understand, uh, I certainly do understand those who don't want to work with me in an institution, because especially a curator, if they're, you know, they're not involved with art. There are a lot of places I go, they're not art people, or they're, you know, they have a collection of Native American art and uh, you know they don't know about contemporary art, so that's just not what they know. Um, so you know, uh, I don't. Uh, but in that I'm there, I think what happened with one other project, at the Seattle Art Museum, is that you know the staff got together and and decided they want to write the catalog, everyone, because I had worked with everyone. And they, one of the things that the, one of the curators said, you know, we may not agree with everything he's doing, but, um, you know, it was important for him to, we felt it was really, it, it, it turned out to be important for him to do it. And, um, but you see, they, they always find themselves in what I do. I'm, I really embed myself with them, and, and they're talking to me constantly about their collections, because I'm not a scholar in every, everything. Uh, I'm learning about the institution, about the city, about the country sometimes, but also about their scholarship. And so they see their scholarship in what I do, uh, even though I'm, I'm sort of not, I'm doing something else with it. To the second part of my question, have you, been, have you ever been invited and then disinvited to any collection? Once I'm there, baby, I'm there. <laughs> we have, there's a thing called a contract. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't get disinvited, but you know, I should say, it's not like everything goes smoothly all the time. In fact, I w used to say, if I, don't, if, if I don't bump into something, then why, you know, then why am I there? Why, why, you know, if there's nothing to bump into, then I'm at the wrong place or I'm doing the wrong thing. Um, but... Um, and we work through it. We figure it out. And there's, you know, I have so many stories about that with, with being, because, you know, I'm in, the, I'm, I'm in the museum. I say I'm an artist. I don't say I'm a curator, which I've done curating, but I, I don't say that uh, because I want to have that, I don't want to put in a box that one can do if you're in an institution. You know, this is your job. I know what that job is, you know. Uh, AAM tells me this. Uh, and, uh, uh, but so I, they just have to take me for who I am. And it's very, dislocating for them. But it's also really empowering because I know more about museums than any than most most museum professionals because I've worked with so many museums. Uh, it's you know it's only skin deep, but I do know a lot about museums. And also I don't kiss and tell. So I have known lots about because people tell me things that they can't tell their, their peers because I'm not part of that world. And I but I, yet I know a lot about that world. And so you know, it's a, it's a great give and take. And I have so many friends around the world because of it. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know where that, what the original, what I was originally talking about, but. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for your work. Um, when you showed the picture of the dollhouse, you were describing to us um, which dolls were in which rooms. I actually became curious. Have you done any work, or do you know of anybody who's done any work in regards to racial tensions, even within the African American race? Uh, whereas you know, the lighter complexions and the darker complexions, and maybe some of the tensions that came from that time period? Uh, mostly, I work with institutions that, pr that 
you know, that say they're public, and I feel if you're going to say that you're a public institution, you need to deal with the public, you need to think about what, what that means. And so I, I generally enjoy working within an institutional context for that reason. That's kind of, you know, how I sit. So I, I really, unless it's a particular institution where that bubbles up as a major issue, it, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't go there. That was the closest thing I, with, the, with, the, with the rip in the face of the canvas and, um, um, and the doll's house. That was the closest I came to it because it just made sense at that moment. Things have to just make sense. But as a subject, uh, unless uh, some particular place that you know strongly was speaking about one way of being, and actually there were these all these other things going on, you know. Otherwise, I you know. So, but it's a good, it's a really interesting subject. Hi, um, thank you for the talk and and for your work as well. I um, just wanted to ask if you had um, noticed any shifts in your practice since you've been doing this over twenty years. Yeah, well, I think what this last piece, uh, well, the one that was in Savannah, was a shift for me because it really wasn't, it, it was a very different kind of critique. It wasn't a critique, basically, of the museum because it was a new collection, new, collection, new museum, <clears throat> and it was a private collection. Uh, so I, um, so for me, it was, it was really different. Uh, I'm, I'm very open, you know, to that. I'm actually excited that, that, that you know, shifted from that because uh, I, um, you know, I, I don't choose the institutions that I that I go to necessarily, but uh, you know, I'd like to believe that I'm nimble enough to sort of respond in, in the way that's necessary, not the way that I that I know. And uh, I, I go tabula rasa. I try to leave everything else behind and just sort of absorb where I am. So um, I almost uh, that that project that I did in Savannah a, few, a couple of years ago was really important because I was almost thinking, well, you know, should I, should I be doing this anymore? People know me, you know. I'm, I'm a part of, I'm, you know, I'm a trustee of the Whitney. It's not like I'm an outsider anymore. It allows me great entree, but <clears throat> I just have to make sure that I'm still on my, you know, still on my game and I'm still feeling these things in a very strong way when I do projects. So, you know, I'm, I'm very happy with that. I have a, Unless, if you're planning to go to Philadelphia, I have a project at, at the Barnes Foundation, which was right now, and it's a very different kind of thing. It's myself, Judy Pfaff, and uh, Mark Dion uh, responding to how Barnes in installed his things. And uh, anyway, it's, it's, you know, I, as long as I, you know, I don't like to repeat myself, what, that's pretty boring. So if, if I don't find something interesting, new way to think about things, and I'm not learning anything, then it's not worth doing. That uh, so many people in this room tonight have heavy hearts and intellects about what's going on in Charleston. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you're willing to, to um, go there. As an artist who's worked in this arena for so long, what are you feeling about what's coming out of Charleston <laughs> and the ripple across uh, our country? I just, I mean, I just had a, you know, I had a conversation at earlier, just slightly earlier, that, um, you know, that we all feel these things deeply, and, and I'm the lucky one to be able to just sort of let it out in my way, you know. Uh, it, things don't, I mean, uh, when you're steeped in history the way I am with a lot of these projects, uh, the continuum of it, the, the, the what's going on, is just you know just really depressing. Uh, uh, I mean, when I did mine the museum, uh, Rodney King happened. I mean, you could just hey, let's just take any year and we can figure out how it's connected to African American history. But you know, Rodney King happened, and it, there are certain things, certain aspects of that. Just, I mean, it was amazing. Like I had like I had thought it was going to happen or something. Uh, the, the connection across history. So we'll see if, if, it's, if that uh, comes to me in some, in some particular way. Um, that's, that's, but uh, all I can say, I mean, I don't really have much to say about it. I wouldn't do something directly about a, a subject 
it's you know it's such a, a raw subject. I work with in institutions, but um, uh, maybe in these projects that I do, something will come out that that will be a way to assess and uh, um, create a new a new paradigm in ways around the, around issues like this or or the uh, ways to deal with things like this because you know this is the horrific situation but it, it won't be this necessarily but you know it's not the last so we have to figure out how, what to do and how to move forward and just to be able to speak strongly in our ways in our own particular ways I don't know I you know I'm just sort of Doing the blah blah right now because it's so horrific. I'm I'm I tell you one little other little story. I was in uh, Wilmington, uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. Doing uh, they brought me down to sort of scope out a project. They it's an art museum that's on a Civil War site, and the Civil War particular Civil War site was where the black troops actually uh, basically took that site, and it was at the end of the war, uh, the Confederacy was retreating, and the Union Army came in and took that site. It was the, the black troops, essentially, the white troops were behind, and obviously uh, the black troops were taking the fire, but they, they did take the town. And, uh, but the site is right there next to the museum, and the, and the museum has sort of ignored it for a long time because of the kind of tensions that they were worried about coming up. And, uh, but then in the last few years, they've had these uh, reenactments there, and people come from, you'd have people dressed in, African Americans dressed in, in Union, arm, Union uniforms and uh, Confederate uniforms and setting up camp, and then reenacting this thing. And, um, hmm. something happened that, during this, which you know, I just realized, man, maybe I should not be telling this story. They might not like this, but uh, something happened that brought the whole thing to a complete stop. Uh, some accident happened. Surprise! Uh, one of the guns was actually did have live bullets in it, uh, so nobody got hurt. But it was the shock that, because you know, in these reenactments, people bring their own guns for hunting or whatever. And um, so it was, rather than checking everybody's guns and make sure that they haven't taken out the bullets for the ducks, you know, uh, this didn't happen. So, uh, so the whole, everybody was shocked about it. And so I, they're reassessing whether they're going to have reenactments anymore. Uh, uh, and uh, so I, it was amazing that I was there for that because I, I was thinking, well, what would I do in this in this environment in, for this, you know, do I do something to commemorate this, you know, this battle scene? Um, and I'm still grappling with it. I have ideas, but since, uh, since Charleston, uh, I don't know if my ideas are enough to, to deal with this uh, uh, in, you know, as an artwork. I, you know, I'm not sure. I'm, I, you know, I do have to discuss with them. I, I've written up something, uh, actually wrote up what I, an idea I had before and how I can handle it. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm an outsider. That's one thing I'm all, I never forget. Whenever I go to a project, a museum, a city, a town, I'm an outsider. And that's a particular role that you have. And you have to sort of understand that and understand that you're not from there. So, and also just how do I get inside that subject? Uh, I don't think I can get inside of it. I realize I can't get inside of it from, from both sides. I am obviously, I am very much on one side of the, of the subject. However, it is a commemorative site for, for both. And so, um, do they just bury the past? Literally, figuratively? Uh, or do they do something that is some kind of a healing uh, or, or a different way to look at the past. And that's where I've left it. That's where I have this idea 
of what, to, what I would do, what I could do, and the extent of what I could do. But I'm also st stuck with, you know, how deep is this, can this go? How deep can I do? You know, I don't want it to be my ego saying I'm coming in. It's not particular, but it's, it, it's very easy for an artist to sort of say, well, I'm, I'm here to do this. But it's not, it's not about that. Uh, it has to be something that they want. Everybody has to want it. So, I don't know. So I don't know what I can do. Okay, well, thank you so much, Rod, and thank you, everyone, for coming.